Hello and welcome to everybody for this evening's uh, Science for All Seasons talk. The Science for All Seasons talks give you a chance to explore hot topics in genomics and biology with leading experts from the Broad Institute. My name is Tom Ulrich, and I'm the Associate Director of Science Communications here at the Broad Institute. And it's my pleasure to welcome all of you here tonight and also to introduce our speakers for the evening, Nimrata Udeshi and Michael Gillette. Nimrata is the Associate Director of our Proteomics platform, while Mike is a Senior Group Leader in Proteomics and Biomarker Discovery at Broad, and is also a Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine Doctor at Massachusetts General Hospital. Together, they will take us on a tour of the science of proteomics, the study of the dynamic mix of proteins that our cells produce. And they'll also talk to us about the opportunities that studying the proteome presents for advancing human health. If you have any questions for Nimrata or Mike, please ask them using Zoom's Q&A function, and we'll do our best to put them out there for everybody uh, during the Q&A portion of the evening. If you happen to be tweeting tonight, please use the hashtag BroadSFAS. And with that, Nimrata, over to you. All right. Well, thanks for the kind introduction, Tom, and thank you all for coming today to hear Mike and I talk about the exciting and ever-evolving field of proteomics. Um, I'll start the session reviewing the XYZs of proteomics and mass spectrometry, and then I'll hand it over to Mike, who will tell you how we use proteomics to address important questions in biology and medicine. So a blueprint contains the instructions needed to make machines, and this example on the slide you see a set of blueprints provide the instructions to make vehicles. The types of vehicles driving on the road tell us about the state of the system or the city. And so because we don't see many construction vehicles on the road, we can determine that the state of the city is already built and functioning to support the society. Similarly, D DNA and genes provide the blueprints to make proteins, the machines of our cells and body. Proteins are constantly changing in our body, but the type and state of proteins that exist in the body at a given time can tell us about the health status or state of the system. And these snapshots can be studied from past, present, or future. The genetic information flow in our cells starts from DNA, which stores our genetic information and is transcribed to RNA, which is translated to proteins, the executors or machines of the cell. And proteins are the most versatile macromolecules in the cell, and they account for approximately 20% of the cell's weight. Proteins belong to different functional classes, including enzymes like kinases, which catalyze or drive different critical reactions in our cells, like phosphorylation. Proteins also play important roles in our body to fight off infection as part of the body's immune system. And the building blocks of proteins are amino acids. There are 20 amino acids that have different chemical properties and determine the protein structure and activity of the protein. So the cartoon on the right sh uh, shows a polypeptide chain, which is made up of amino acids being translated from mRNA on the ribosome of the protein synthesis factory. So something that's been on all of our minds and the reason why this talk is virtual is the COVID-19 pandemic. The good news is that in a year's time, effective vaccines have been developed and notably several of these vaccines are mRNA based and leverage the translation process in our cells. The mRNA provides provided in the vaccines provides a template to make pieces of a spike protein that is unique to SARS-CoV-2. And once we are injected with the mRNA vaccine, the cells in our body start making the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein, which causes our immune systems to begin producing protein antibodies and activate immune cells to fight off what it thinks is an infection. These antibodies are specific to the virus, which means the immune system is hopefully primed to protect against future infection. So studying proteins is just as important as studying genes because the information you gather is different and complementary. The genome is far more static than the proteome throughout the lifespan of a cell or organism with proteomes varying dramatically. The classic example of this is shown here, the caterpillar transforming itself into a butterfly. Both have strikingly different proteomes resulting in these remarkably different phenotypes, but they have the same genome. Because, pro because proteomes are dynamic and can result in different outputs, it's critically important to study proteins to develop drugs that can be effective to treat different states of a system. The analysis of proteomes can be much more challenging than sequencing genomes because the proteome is highly complex and dynamic. There are many more protein forms due to alternative splicing, various post-translational modifications, 
and post-translational modifications are covalent modifications that introduce new reactive groups to specific amino acids on proteins, regulating their function and acting as molecular switches. So for the rest of my talk, I'm going to guide you through the technology we use at Broad to study proteomes. In some senses, proteomics is a relatively nascent field, and it is also a rapidly evolving field driven by technology development. And it's important to note that proteomics is not a single strategy or technique, but in reality, it's a field composed of myriad tools and workflows that may be different depending on the sample type and the nature of the question being asked. That being said, the workhorse technology in proteomics is mass spectrometry, and essentially a mass spectrometer is a fancy instrument for weighing, mole weighing peptide molecules. In the macroscopic world, we measure the weight of something using a scale and the force of gravity. However, the weights of molecular peptides are too small to use a scale and gravity, but what we can do is ionize peptides into a mass spectrometer that is under a vacuum, and we can measure peptide ions response to electric fields. The resulting data is the mass of a molecule per number of charges, and from this M over Z ratio, we can determine the mass of peptides in the sample. So in some respects, it's confusing and counterintuitive, but for a typical proteomics experiment, we start by cleaving proteins into peptides, and the reason for this is that peptides are far e easier to analyze than proteins, and this is because of several reasons. One, we use liquid chromatography separation in front of the mass spectrometer to separate peptides, and peptides are far more stable and separate, separate far better than proteins. Peptides also fragment more effectively in the mass spectrometer than proteins, and the MS data is far easier to interpret for peptides. So to generate peptides, we commonly use enzymes such as tryptin, which are very specific and cleave proteins at the C-terminus of arginine and lysines. So samples in proteomics start as liquids at atmospheric pressure and need to get into the mass spectrometer, which measures molecules in the gas phase under vacuum. The technique of getting ions from the liquid to the gas phase is called electrospray ionization, for which John Fenn was awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2002. And in his Nobel lecture, he likened it to giving protein molecular elephants wings to fly. Just briefly, the way this works is that peptides in the liquid phase are loaded onto a chromatography column and separated by HPLC into the mass spectrometer. The electrospray is created by putting a voltage on a flow of liquid, which is sprayed directly into the opening of the mass spectrometer. And the liquid droplets are desolvated eventually, and the ions are ejected from the droplets and accelerated into the mass spectrometer by voltages. And once ions are inside the vacuum system of the mass spectrometer, the ions are guided and manipulated by electric fields. A mass spectrometer collects data describing the intensity of ions detected versus their mass to charge ratio. So the first step is to measure an MS1 scan. You can see that right here to get a snapshot of all the intact peptide masses that are present at a given time. The second step is to select peptide ions, in this case, this red ball, and collide it with inert gases to break the peptide apart into smaller pieces, these red shapes. And the masses of these pieces of the peptide can be read out in a second mass spectrometry scan to obtain peptide sequence information. And this process is done over and over again as peptides continue to elute from the column. So now that we've completed the analysis on the mass spectrometer, what do we need to do to identify all peptide sequences from the sample? The fragmentation patterns we record in the mass spectrometer can be read out to determine amino acid sequences. So you see one such peptide here. Peptides typically fragment at the amide bond and generate two series of ions. B ions contain the N-terminus of the peptide and Y ions contain the C-terminus of the peptide. The peaks in this fragmentation spectrum are separated by the mass of amino acids. And like a puzzle, you can fit all the pieces together to identify the linear sequence of the peptide. We do this process in an automated manner because a single MS run can result in hundreds of thousands of spectra to interpret. And to do this, we use database search engines to search mass spectrometry data against organism-specific sequence databases derived from sequence genomes. We liken this process to looking up answers in the back of the book, where the book is our reference database. Search engines essentially correlate MS spectra to in silico spectra, which you can see here, um, generated from the database and report these correlations as scores with the highest scoring match yielding the peptide identification. Our group typically uses SpectraMill to search data, 
And SpectraMill is a versatile search engine developed by Carl Clauser in our group. Once the data is searched and the output of the proteome experiment uh, has been complete, has, we've gotten the output of the proteome experiment, we see that it can be very large depending on sample size. For a proteome experiment, the data is summarized as a list of proteins with information related to its identification and relative intensity of the protein in samples. However, because we don't measure proteins directly in the mass spectrometer, the protein level information comes from the underlying peptides that have been identified and assigned to the protein by sophisticated protein grouping algorithms. So indeed, proteomic analyses can be used to quad qualitatively identify thousands of proteins and samples, but in reality, proteomics experiments are far from cataloging exercises. In fact, the power comes from the need to understand how proteomes change in similar but perturbed systems to reveal true molecular mechanisms in the cell. So how do we do this? There are a few approaches to compare samples in discovery proteomics. Conceptually, the simplest is label-free analysis, which means that wet lab processing and measurement of each sample on the mass spectrometer is done one at a time. The advantage of the label-free approach is that the wet lab processing is simple and fairly straightforward and minimal, and the approach is flexible. However, the downsides are that more instrument time is needed because everything is done individually, and data analysis can be complex due to stochastic sampling in the mass spectrometer, and oftentimes you have missing samples across sample sets you want to compare, um, and you have missing data points. So in the proteomics group at Broad, our method of choice for comparing proteomes of different samples is a chemical labeling method called TMT, which allows us to multiplex or combine measurements of proteomes from up to 16 different samples at one time. This technique involves labeling peptide samples following protein digestion and can be used to measure cells as well measure cells as well as in vivo samples like primary tissue samples. So let me walk you through how a TMT experiment works. Here on the slide, you see I have six different samples, but we can just as easily uh, scale up to 16 samples. Proteins are first digested to peptides. And once at the peptide level, samples are labeled with different isotopic versions of TMT reagents, which you can think of as different colored tags that allow us to differentiate the samples in the mass spectrometer. The label samples can then be mixed together to create one signal at the peptide level, but once the peptide is fragmented in the mass spectrometer, the different TMT reagents or colors yield distinct reporter ions or signals in the spectrum. And this technique allows not only to identify peptides, but determine their relative abundance across all the samples in a single run. So let's put this all together. The proteomics workflow can be essentially divided into three basic parts, designing the experiment, preparing the sample, and acquiring and analyzing the data. The first step in designing the experiment is to determine the question we want to address so we can choose the most appropriate proteomic workflow. Proteomes can be quantitatively compared between two or more samples, enabling readout of differential protein expression. Proteomics can also be used to describe localization of proteins in the cell and how this localization may change upon perturbation. This type of experiment may involve pre-enrichment of subcellular regions prior to analysis. And with high multiplexing strategies like TMT, we can also monitor proteome dynamics of complex processes over time. So one can ask the question, how are proteins or PTMs changing in the cell at time zero compared to a later time point over the course of drug treatment or cellular development? So once we decide on the workflow, the sample is prepared, as peptides and labeled with TMT, as I just described, there may be a pre-fractionation step required prior to mass spectrometry analysis to further separate peptides to gain deeper coverage of complex peptide mixtures. Finally, we acquire the data on the mass spectrometer, and once the data has been generated, it's searched and ready for data analysis. Once we have proteomics data, the fun and also the challenge begins to interpret the biological meaning within the domain of the particular project. There are many informatics tools that we use to work with proteomics data, and I'll just highlight uh, one, Prodigy, which is a tool developed by Karsten Krug in the proteomics group. And Prodigy is a highly valuable um, tool for analyzing proteomics data because it offers a bridge between bioinformatics and the non-bioinformatics researchers and take the output of data sets um, and, and 
database searches and enables downstream analysis of proteomic data. The analysis of proteomic data is multifaceted, involves bioinformatics, statistics, machine learning to study data reproducibility, statistical, identify statistically significant proteins affected by experimental perturbations, and you can cluster data to reveal patterns in the data to reveal regulated proteins, gene sets, or pathways across sample conditions. So as I noted towards the beginning of the presentation, post-translational modifications are essential to protein function and mass spectrometry-based proteomics is very well suited to study these modifications because they lead to characteristic mass shifts. And therefore, we have the ability to locate the site of modification within the resolution of a single amino acid. Studying post-translational modifications offers us yet another window into the proteome and allows us to ask questions about how modification states and all change and also how different post-translational modifications interpret signals and talk to each other in the cell. And while it's true that mass spectrometry is well suited to study post-translational modifications, it's extremely challenging because these modifications occur at very low levels, oftentimes making up less than 1% or even 0.1% of the form of a given protein. And unlike genomics, proteomics has no way to amplify signal. So to study low abundant protein modifications, we need to enrich them away from all the other abundant non-modified proteins in the sample. The most frequently studied uh, post-translational modifications in our group are listed here, phosphorylation, ubiquitylation, and acetylation. And to enrich these modifications, we use affinity chromatography or antibodies that are specific for each of these modifications, but also general enough that they recognize these modifications no matter the surrounding peptide sequence. So to monitor multiple PTMs to study crosstalk, the good news is that we don't need to use separate samples to do this, and we can do this all from a single sample, which saves precious material, which is especially important when working with patient samples. The proteomics group has developed integrated workflows that include multiplex TMT quantitation and measurement of the ubiquitolome, proteome, phosphoproteome, and lysine acetylome in single TMT sample sets to measure proteins and sites of modification with very deep coverage, and you can see the coverage here. So what we've talked about so far is discovery proteomics experiment, which can be likened to shooting many arrows at a sample to get as many peptide hits as possible, but what peptides we hit is not up to us. So although global proteomics offers deep coverage of proteomes, depending on the question at hand, one issue can be that you don't see the same peptides every time. So for example, as shown on this slide, if you inject the sample twice on a mass spectrometer, you get some overlapping peptides and some not. This is because uh, sampling in the mass spectrometer is stochastic and peptides that get identified are based on many parameters, including speed of the instrument, sample complexity and dynamic range. So in contrast to discovery um, proteomics, where we shoot lots of arrows, targeted mass spectrometry strategies are incredibly powerful for reducing missing data by shooting fewer arrows to monitor selected peptides every time. Targeted mass spectrometry is a powerful technology for finding the needles in the haystack. For targeted mass spectrometry, assays are pre-configured to only monitor selected peptides. So this means that when the haystack of peptides is eluding from the column into the mass spectrometer, as you can see here, we only spend time measuring the peptide needle we care about. And what makes this even more powerful is the fact that we are not limited to one needle, but can measure hundreds simultaneously with much greater sensitivity than discovery methods. Beyond measuring the peptides of interest every time and reducing missing data, targeted methods offer precise quantitation because isotopically heavy versions of peptides we want to monitor are synthesized and spiked into the sample at known quantities. So the levels of peptides in our sample can be compared to the level of the standard. So this plot, on the right shows you a signal for the heavy and light pair of peptides monitored in a targeted assay across multiple samples. And you can see that we get a measurement for both species every time. The proteomics group has helped pioneer targeted technologies in the context of clinical biomarker studies, but targeted methods are now finding increasing application for non-clinical studies as assays have been set up in our group to routinely monitor several hundred phosphorylation sites to study broad swaths of signaling biology. And then you can see some of the 
uh, proteins and sites that have been configured in our group. And with that, I will end my part of the talk and note that road proteomics has greatly contributed to the field through many technological advancements, the majority of which I didn't have time to talk about today. Uh, but what I've shown you today is that we now have methods to study the proteome post-translational modifications with unprecedented coverage, which has paved the way for integration of MS-based proteomics as a central technology in biological science at the Broad and beyond. And so with that, I'll hand the presentation over to my dear colleague, Mike Gillette, who will tell you about how we have used proteomic methods to address important questions in biology and medicine. All right, thank you, Namrata. So the techniques and technologies that Namrata has so beautifully described are very powerful tools for probing deeply and broadly into the proteome and its modifications. But by themselves, the tools don't solve problems or teach us new biology or give us new clinical insights. To take fullest advantage of their capabilities, the investigator needs, among other things, to ask the right questions, find the right samples, choose the right experimental strategies, do the right analyses of the data, work with the right people, and always continue to push the frontiers of what the technologies can do and how they can be deployed. So over the next little while, I'll provide a handful of examples looking at some actual data that I hope will illustrate how these other considerations, what I'm calling the art of the experiment, can help us use proteomics technologies to best advantage in answering questions we care about. I'll start with an important problem in global health. Despite some progress in recent years, pneumonia remains a leading cause of death of children worldwide and the leading cause of death in children under five years of age, as shown in the bar plot on the left. Pneumonia in children presents with a set of characteristic symptoms illustrated on the right, things like fever and chills, a cough, or rapid, noisy, or difficult breathing. The challenge is that that set of respiratory symptoms I've just described can be caused by a number of different types of infection, including bacterial and viral infections, and in areas where malaria is common, malaria. So this pattern of clinical pneumonia can have different pathological underpinnings and lead to different types of immune response in the infected individual. Now it's important for the care of the individual patient to know the cause so that you can use the appropriate therapy antibiotics for bacterial pneumonia, anti-malarials for malaria. Now, generally speaking, there aren't the same sort of specific treatments for viral infections, but you don't want to expose children to the potential side effects of drugs that won't work for their condition. And from a public health perspective, using antibiotics inappropriately contributes to antibiotic resistance, a very important and growing problem throughout the world. In Boston, all kinds of tests might help determine the cause of the pneumonia syndrome, but in much of the world, these resources are not readily available. This led experts to get together and define a so-called target product profile for the characteristics of a test to distinguish bacterial from non-bacterial causes of pneumonia and other infections. A blood test was favored because blood, even if only from a finger prick, is generally easier to get from children than other types of samples. Since it ultimately needs to be an inexpensive point of care test, maybe a dipstick or a little chip that could be read out in a cell phone, it should be based on only a few markers. And to guide clinical decisions, they thought it should have at least a sensitivity of 90%, meaning 90% of the time, if a kid had bacterial pneumonia, you'd detect it, and a specificity of 80%, meaning that if your test said, a, test said a kid had bacterial pneumonia, that would be true 80% of the time. So that helps us to ask the right question. Can we use proteomics approaches to identify proteins in blood that distinguish different causes of pediatric pneumonia syndrome? And can we design a test that needs only a few of those proteins to be accurate enough to guide treatment decisions? Working with an international team, we collected and analyzed blood samples from almost 200 children in Mozambique who presented with clinical pneumonia and had the sort of extensive testing we might do here in Boston to determine whether that was due to bacterial or viral or malarial infection. The left-hand panel shows what we were able to do with the blood test to differentiate viral from bacterial causes of pneumonia. The most important distinction, because malaria isn't everywhere, and because there are already pretty good point of care tests for malaria. <laughs> 
as you can see, if we use all 219 proteins that were at different levels in the blood of kids with bacteria or virus, we did quite well. Importantly though, we still achieved 90% sensitivity and 85% specificity with only five proteins, a number that might work for a point of care test. Notably, a large proportion of the useful proteins related to neutrophil biology, as might have been predicted based on the body's response to bacterial infection. As you can see on the right though, differentiating all three causes was a harder problem and we really couldn't achieve the sensitivity we needed. So in places where malaria is common, the test might need to be paired with a malaria rapid diagnostic test. Of course, marker discovery is just the beginning of a long road to an actual diagnostic test, but nevertheless, it's an encouraging start and our proteins may provide the foundation of a test that could help ensure children in respiratory distress get the treatments they need to get better. Let's turn for a moment from pneumonia to myocardial infarctions, heart attacks, to illustrate the value of finding the right samples. People come to the emergency department with chest pain all the time. Some are having heart attacks, but others have severe heartburn or muscle strains or lung problems or panic attacks or many other things. Now, there's a saying in the cardiology world that time is muscle meaning that the longer it takes from the onset of symptoms in a heart attack to restoration of adequate blood supply to the heart tissue, the more damage is done to the heart. The lower left bar plot shows the increase in heart attack death as the number of minutes from symptoms to restored blood supply increase. Nowadays, restoring blood flow is usually done by opening closed coronary vessels with a balloon and often holding them open with a stent. But obviously you can't be doing that to everybody with chest pain. There are pretty good protein biomarkers of heart attacks called troponins. But as shown on the right, it can take hours after a heart attack for troponins to reach diagnostic levels. Of course, doctors don't just use biomarkers. They also look at EKGs and get symptom profiles and so forth. But it would clearly be useful to find other proteins in blood that signal the heart attack, preferably within the first hour. So there again is our right question. How could you ever find those though? Unless someone conveniently developed a heart attack when already in the hospital and someone was right there to draw their blood, you'd never get samples at the earliest time points. It would be easier to do this if you could actually give people heart attacks, but you can't do that, right? Well, as it turns out, sometimes you can. There's a condition called hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy in which a part of the heart muscle separating the left and right ventricles gets too big and interferes with blood flow out of the heart to the rest of the body. It can give people chest pain, shortness of breath, lightheadedness, or other symptoms. To improve those symptoms, you need to get rid of the excess heart muscle. One way to do that is to inject alcohol down a small branch of one of the heart arteries that feeds the extra heart muscle, which destroys it. Now, whether you look at the onset of chest pain or the EKG or at the tissue under a microscope, this mimics an acute myocardial infarction, a heart attack. But it's planned and you can position a catheter to collect blood starting before the injury and then at whatever intervals you choose thereafter. In the case of this study at 10 minutes and at one, two, four, and 24 hours. Now, Namrata talked to you about discovery workflows using things called isobaric labels so that multiple samples can be analyzed all at once in parallel. And that's the approach that was used here. After initial processing, four samples drawn at baseline and 10 minutes, 60 minutes, and four hours after this planned MI were labeled and mixed for analysis following the workflow on the left. 333 proteins were found that changed their relative abundance from one time point to the next. And then those were grouped together according to how they behaved over time. Proteins like those in clusters one to three in the middle that increased from baseline to 10 and 60 minutes, the blind spot of current biomarkers were of particular interest. Then as Namrata described, Targeted assays for specific proteins of interest were developed so that they could be accurately measured in parallel in a larger number of samples. An example is shown here on the right for a uh, protein called FHL1, with the red signal from the patient's blood clearly increasing relative to the blue signal from the spiked standard peptide 
as you go from baseline to 60 minutes. This strategy worked well to find new candidate biomarkers for early detection of heart attacks. But to be honest, I glossed over some of the real challenges with this work. Let's focus for a moment on some of the processing steps that happened before the samples ever got to the mass spectrometer. The initial samples were passed through two different columns that use antibodies to pull out highly abundant plasma proteins like albumin that we don't expect to be particularly informative. This involves quite a lot of work and the columns themselves are very expensive. So it both slows down the workflow and adds a lot to the cost of analyzing a sample. Later, after the labeled sample was pooled, that pooled sample was separated into 24 fractions, each one of which had to be analyzed for hours on the mass spectrometer. That too slows down the analysis and adds to its cost. To understand why all that's necessary, it's helpful to take a closer look at blood plasma. Blood plasma may be the most complex of all proteomes. That's part of its usefulness. There's a sense that almost everything going on in the body might be reflected to some degree in the blood, but it poses challenges. Plasma also has a huge dynamic range, that is the difference in quantity between its most abundant and least abundant proteins. In fact, we don't really know the levels of the least abundant proteins because we don't even yet have ways to measure them. But even the proteins that we measure clinically, which are the ones that are shown in this diagram, span 11 orders of magnitude in abundance. Mass spectrometers have a smaller dynamic range shown by the red bar on the left. And when used in the way that Namrata described, typically work their way down from the most abundant to the least abundant proteins, meaning all those abundant proteins are getting in the way of the signal we wanna see. Now, we may not need to get to the very lowest levels of plasma proteins, since lots of useful protein biomarkers, like the troponins we were just talking about, fall around this red line. But that is still eight orders of magnitude down from the most abundant plasma proteins. And I wanna help you put that in perspective. On the right side of the slide here, you can see Earth in the distance. Suppose you started here and then moved 10 times closer. When you had done that eight times, that is you'd covered eight orders of magnitude, you'd be here. So in these terms, finding biomarkers like troponin in plasma is a bit like counting the stripes on a bee from the moon. It's a challenging problem. And a big part of the reason we need all of that sample processing I mentioned to do plasma proteomics with mass spectrometry. So while that is one right strategy, there are other approaches to proteomics that can be powerful, especially when we're analyzing plasma. In particular, affinity-based methods can be useful. The many variations have in common the use of an antibody or other type of so-called affinity or capture reagent to pull proteins of interest out of the vast background of the plasma or other sample, enriching them before detection and measurement. You might have heard of ELISAs. Those are one type of affinity approach, though the basic ELISA immunoassay measures only one protein, so it isn't quite proteomics. But with lots of engineering, many capture reagents can be put together, for instance, on a chip or on a slide. Unlike the unbiased mass spectrometry approaches we've talked about, these affinity approaches only measure the specific set of proteins for which there are capture reagents. But as the scale of some of these platforms has begun to reach thousands of proteins, they can still facilitate discovery. Various approaches are used to do the detection and quantification of what the capture reagents pull down other antibodies as shown in A and B on the left, or mass spectrometry as shown in D. A variation on the two antibody approach called single molecule array or SAMOA shown on the right, uses antibody coded beads to capture single proteins in tiny wells, and then a sensitive detector to count them. To date, this can only be done for a handful of proteins at a time, say 10 or fewer, but it can be thousands of times more sensitive than a standard immunoassay. Let's take a look at a problem for which we used a series of affinity-based rather than mass spectrometry focused strategies to work towards our goal. Hopefully we'll soon get ahead of COVID-19, but tuberculosis will remain a devastating infectious disease, sickening millions and claiming 1.5 million lives annually. Existing molecular tests for TB are good, but require basic infrastructure not reliably available in resource-limited settings. Millions without access to these tests 
aren't readily able to travel to get them. This leads to delays in diagnosis, which in turn contribute to illness and death, while these many undiagnosed and contagious people continue to spread the disease. Historically, sputum has been the main diagnostic sample, but it can be difficult to collect from high-risk HIV-infected persons and children. A blood test would be better. So recognizing all this, the World Health Organization called for development of a point-of-care triage test that determined which patients with TB-like symptoms, things like a fever and productive cough lasting a couple of weeks, were most or least likely to actually have active tuberculosis, determining who should be referred for a confirmatory test and who could be watched. The WHO's target product profile for such a blood test is shown on the right, and again, provides our right question. Now, I don't wanna go through this in detail, but a lot of work went into making sure we also had the right samples from patients with TB-like symptoms who did or did not turn out to have active tuberculosis, as well as some samples from patients who were successfully treated for TB. The right strategy here refers to several elements of this experiment outlined in the rather complex flow diagram on the left. Since we were dealing with plasma and expected a final point of care diagnostic to be an antibody-based test, we used an affinity-based approach for the discovery. This led us to the set of four markers shown in the upper right bar plots. You can see that levels of these proteins are higher in patients with active tuberculosis than in patients with other types of pneumonia, and that they go back down after treatment. Since we hope for the test to be sensitive enough to work with just a blood from a finger prick, we developed assays for these proteins using the ultra-sensitive Samoa method I mentioned a minute ago. We then tested performance in a completely different set of samples from different parts of the world to show that it worked in those as well. And finally, once we had the basic test, we began to tweak its performance by testing other proteins together with it. In the end, by this quite rigorous standard, we came within a percent or two of the performance specified by the WHO. This gives us a strong foundation upon which to develop point of care test. Now, the examples I've shown thus far focus on narrowly defined clinical problems and on proteins that go up or down in disease. But other analyses are more complicated, like work trying to better understand the molecular biology of specific cancers and identify new possibilities for treatment. The Broad was heavily involved in something called the Cancer Genome Atlas, which analyzed DNA and RNA from thousands of tumors representing 33 cancer types. But protein measurements in TCGA covered only 100 or so proteins and a still smaller number of phosphocytes. As part of the National Cancer Institute's Clinical Proteomics Tumor Analysis Consortium, we want to fill in the faint parts of the cancer profiling effort that are shown upper right through what's called cancer proteogenomics, the integration of proteomic and post-translational modification data with genomics. An example is our work on lung cancer the leading cancer killer both in the United States and worldwide. We want to see what new insights we can gain into lung cancer biology and vulnerabilities through this integration and to provide a resource to the cancer community, allowing investigators around the world to analyze the data, explore their own questions, and develop new hypotheses to guide their future research. We prospectively collected 100 treatment-naive primary lung adenocarcinoma tumors and paired normal tissues that were close to those tumors with protocols designed to ensure the very dynamic and changeable post-translational modifications were as close as possible to the native biology. And then we used the cutting edge multiplexed approaches that Namrata described for protein and post-translational modification characterization. Together with state-of-art genomics data, we measure more than 10,000 proteins 40,000 phosphocytes and many thousands of acetylcytes and ubiquitol sites in each tumor. Now, the amount of data generated in these experiments is massive, and finding meaning in it requires the thoughtful efforts of the best biologists, computational people, and statisticians. I'll highlight just two types of analyses these data enable, though the list is truly vast. As Namrata has explained, protein phosphorylation is of special interest since phosphocytes can regulate the activity and other important characteristics of proteins. If a particular phosphorylation site on a specific protein 
is highly phosphorylated just in a certain circumstance, say in the presence of a particular mutation that drives a cancer, it's a so-called outlier in that circumstance and might be interesting and biologically important. On this slide, I show three examples of how outlier phosphocytes can be used. One very important driver of lung adenocarcinoma, especially in people who've never smoked, is a so-called fusion event in which the front end of one gene joins the back end of another, in this case, the ALK gene. It's important to identify patients with these fusions since there are multiple targeted drugs that work in this population. We found that a particular phosphorylation site on the ALK protein was much more highly phosphorylated in patients with those fusions relative to all the other patients or the normal adjacent tissues. That's shown upper left, where all the little dots on the right-hand side are values in fusion cases. It turns out that an antibody to that specific phosphocyte may in some cases work even better than the tests that are currently being used clinically to identify these ALK-driven tumors. Now this ALK protein is a kinase, meaning that it can go on to phosphorylate other proteins. Because the fusion protein is abnormal, it can end up in parts of the cell where it normally doesn't belong. And so it can phosphorylate proteins it doesn't normally phosphorylate which can help explain why it can cause lung cancer. We found six proteins that were very highly phosphorylated in ALK fusion-driven lung adenocarcinomas compared to other lung adenocarcinomas. Those are shown in red in the center panel, including proteins known to affect cancer growth and invasion, substantially expanding our thoughts about signaling events that might lead to cancer in this population. The right-hand plot shows levels of RNA expression on the horizontal axis and protein and PTM expression on the vertical axis for cancers driven by EGFR, another very important mutation in lung adenocarcinoma. In this plot, proteins are in green, acetylation sites in gold and phosphocytes in maroon with the outliers indicated by triangles. You can easily see very extreme outlier expression of a phosphocyte on a protein called PTPN11, which is known to increase the activity of this protein and thereby to help cancer cells grow and survive. In the bottom right heat map, where red is high phosphocyte expression and blue is low, it's clear that almost all lung adenocarcinomas driven by this EGFR mutation and almost no others show elevation. It turns out that very promising inhibitors of this PTPN11 protein are already in clinical trials. And our data suggests that we might be able to use levels of this phosphocyte to determine which patients with lung cancer would benefit from those therapies. Another advantage of our lung cancer data sets is that we had both tumors and paired normal adjacent tissues. Proteins consistently higher in tumors than in normal tissues might provide insights into cancer development or be cancer targets for diagnostic or predictive biomarkers, and some might be therapeutic targets. The left-hand portion of this slide is just an illustration of the sort of lookup table resource we provide to the research community. In this case, for the top 50 of hundreds of proteins that were overexpressed in lung squamous cell tumors relative to normal tissues. These describe various characteristics that are useful for scientists to know, such as whether the proteins get secreted from cells or have drugs that might decrease their levels or function. If these proteins are important for cancer biology, some might be associated with survival. When we searched databases with survival data, that, that proved true for 19 of them. Four examples are shown in the top right, where the blue lines in each case show that patients with lower levels of that protein lived longer than patients with higher levels of the protein, shown in red. Another way to determine whether proteins are important to cancer cells is to see whether the cells die when levels of those proteins are reduced. In the bottom plot, the proteins that were higher in tumors than normal tissues are in blue and mostly fall to the left of the rest of the proteins in red, indicating that lung cancer cell lines were more dependent on them and did worse when they were reduced or eliminated, supporting the notion that these analyses help us to identify functionally important proteins. Well, all the applications I've presented thus far involved collaborators with skill sets critical to the success of the projects. Some of our projects would never even get off the ground without the passion and deep expertise of our collaborators. We're fortunate to work in a community where the opportunities to interact with such thought leaders abound. 
One such example of working with the right team is our collaboration with the lab of Ben Ebert, now chair of medical oncology at the Dana-Farber. They have a special interest in blood abnormalities like myelodysplastic syndrome and cancers like multiple myeloma. The drug thalidomide and more potent close, closely related drugs like lenalidomide have multiple biological effects, including their effectiveness in treatment of blood cancers like multiple myeloma. As some of you may know, thalidomide itself has been around for more than half a century. It's notorious for having been used in the late 50s and early 60s to treat pregnant women for morning sickness and insomnia. Tragically, it turned out to have severe impacts on the developing fetus, leading to terrible limb deformities and death in thousands of infants born to mothers taking this drug. Despite the age of the drug class and the broad range of biological effects they've been shown to have, it hasn't been clear how they worked. Ben's team wanted to work with Namrata and others in the proteomics group to help figure that out. Now in 2010, a Japanese group showed that this drug, thalidomide, binds to the protein CRBN, which in turn is part of a complex of proteins that can add ubiquitol groups that Namrata talked about before to other proteins. So the team knew that CRBN was likely involved in the effects of these drugs, but not how or why. One important question was what proteins, other than those known to be part of that complex, would bind to CRBN. To study this, a SILAC approach like Namrata described earlier was used in which cells were grown that it incorporated heavy labeled amino acids so their proteins could be told apart from the other proteins in the mass spectrometer and expressed the protein CRBN attached to a little tag called HA. By using an antibody to HA, CRBN can then be pulled down from all the other proteins, a type of affinity approach. Proteins tightly attached to CRBN would also come down with it. So the question was, what different proteins come down with CRBN when the cells that were exposed to lenalidomide compared to when they weren't? And these plots in which lenalidomide treated cells are on the right and untreated cells are on the left, you can see that most of the proteins detected at high levels, those are the ones in the upper right, are the same with or without lenalidomide exposure. But the bright blue and pink proteins, IKZF1 and 3, are at much higher levels in the lenalidomide exposed cells, suggesting that lenalidomide made them bind more tightly to CRBN. Now remember, the function of the pro protein complex of which CRBN is a part is to add ubiquitin groups to proteins. And ubiquitin generally is a signal that leads a protein to be degraded. The team performed a number of experiments that suggested that IKZF1 and 3 were indeed ubiquitinated when exposed to lenalidomide. But was that how lenalidomide worked in multiple myeloma? If so, those proteins should be specifically downregulated in multiple myeloma cells treated with lenalidomide compared to those without treatment. The plot on the left shows that's exactly what happens. Those proteins, again in blue and pink, are dramatically decreased in myeloma cell lines treated with the drug. So now the more complete story could be told, as illustrated on the right. In the presence of lenalidomide, IKZF1 and 3 bound more tightly to CRBN, leading them to be ubiquitolated by that protein complex and subsequently degraded with their decreased levels causing the myeloma cells to stop growing. In fact, drugs that work in this way by leading to the degradation of proteins that are important to cancer cell survival and growth have become a very hot topic of research. The projects I've talked about were generally innovative in how they were designed or were pushing the capabilities of the technologies to their limits. But mass spectrometers keep getting faster and more sensitive and all kinds of new ways of processing biological materials are being developed. And to do the most exciting and impactful science, it's important to keep pushing the frontiers. There's a lot of work going on like that in the group, but one major theme is developing the ability to work with smaller and smaller amounts of material, which allows you to answer all kinds of questions you wouldn't previously have been able to even ask appropriately. And I'm gonna close with one such example. The cancer proteogenomics work I briefly discussed was based on the bulk analysis of tumors that were surgically removed from the patient. But what if you could do the same work from just a single biopsy specimen? Currently, when a cancer treatment is started, the patient and clinician have to wait weeks or months following the size of a tumor to get a sense of whether the drug is working. 
But what if you could read out the molecular response of the tumor within just a couple of days of treatment? You might be able to reassure patients who are responding well, avoid the toxicity and expense of drugs that weren't having the desired effect, and possibly find signals that would suggest new therapies. Working with colleagues at Baylor, we've made a start on just that. A single needle biopsy specimen is cut into small slices that are distributed for proteomics, genomics, and future analyses. Some slices throughout the tumor are examined under a microscope, so we can be sure the biopsy is tumor all the way through. Analyzing these specimens, we've been able to get the same level of DNA and RNA sequencing and global proteomic data as in our analyses of the whole tumor, and more than 20,000 phosphocytes per sample. In this final slide, I'm showing that we've begun to use this approach on biopsy samples collected from clinical trials with some encouraging early results. The upper left plots show the levels of a protein called ERB-B2 before and 48 to 72 hours after treatment with anti-ERB-B2 therapy. In patients who ultimately did not respond to that therapy on the left, protein levels were unchanged. But in responsive patients, they went down, as shown on the right. Now remember, these measurements were made within days of starting treatment, whereas it took months to decide whether the drugs were working by conventional methods. But the data gave us more than that. Often there were hints both about why a particular tumor might not be responding and about other treatments they might be vulnerable to. For instance, the lower left heat map shows that tumor 1369, a non-responder to that anti-ERB2 therapy, expressed much higher levels of proteins called mucins than other tumors. This makes sense since mucins have been shown to interfere with the binding of the drug. The upper right plot uses the phosphoprotein data from these analyses to look at which signaling pathways seem to be active in individual tumors. As indicated by the red boxes, a pathway involving what's called mTOR signaling is quite active in tumor 1369. In breast cancer cell lines, mTOR signaling has been shown to increase mucin expression. So together, this predicts that using an inhibitor of this mTOR might work in tumor 1369. Now, these are very early days and we're nowhere near ready to make clinical decisions in patients based on these kinds of analyses. But we were able to test this hypothesis in mice with a breast tumor that expressed high levels of mucin, like our patient's tumor. Here, the lines that are going up steeply show tumors that are growing rapidly, and the flatter lines show tumors that are growing much more slowly. When these mice were treated with the anti-ERB2 drug that didn't work for the patient, it didn't work for the mice. That's the line in purple. When treated with a drug that inhibits mTOR, they responded well. That's the line in green. And interestingly, when those two drugs were put together, the response was better still. That's the line in blue. Now, all the projects I've shared today and a hundred more I didn't have time to mention share the driving motivation of our group to use the great and growing power of proteomics approaches to enable experiments that ask the right questions, use the right samples, strategies, and analyses, and involve the right teams to learn more about biology, better understand disease, and ultimately improve human health. We're excited to continue pushing those frontiers. Namrata and I wanna thank all of the people in the proteomics group who did all the work that we talked about today, and especially call attention to our fearless leader, Dr. Stephen Carr, a world leader in biological mass spectrometry and the glue that holds all the pieces together. And with that, we thank you all for listening. I would be try to, happy to try to answer any questions you might have. And thank you, Mike and Namrata, for a fantastic talk. There was a lot in there, and we're going to try to unpack some of it through some of the questions that have come in. Uh, first off, I want to ask Namrata, you mentioned post-translational modifications a few times. Can you describe um, a couple of examples of how these modifications, well, what do they what do they do to the protein and how do they affect what a protein does, how it, how it behaves as a machine? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you just heard Mike tell some beautiful stories where you know post-translational modifications were relevant in disease. Um, ubiquitination um, is not a small molecule modification, but in fact, a protein modification as Mike described for the lenalidomide story. And ubiquitin serves a really important function as it targets proteins for degradation. So dysfunctional proteins or proteins that um, need to be degraded 
um, will be marked for such an event through ubiquitination. Phosphorylation can be <coughs> activating or deactivating as uh, some of what Mike shared with you. Acetylation um, has a lot of roles in um, gene transcription, et cetera. So there are a lot of modifications. They don't work alone. Sometimes they work together and they talk to each other. Um, so that gives you a sense of PTMs. And a lot of times PTMs affect what proteins bind to other proteins or they affect the structure of a protein. So there are different ways that PTMs affect proteins, but they are essential to doing the work of signaling in the cell. Okay. And then are they also encoded by the genome or how does the cell know where to put which tag on which protein at any given time? Yeah, so that it's about sequence and it's about circuits and systems and um, so some proteins act as substrates for enzymes. And so some proteins have linear sequence motifs that are recognized by enzymes. So they know to go put a modification on that particular protein. So amino acid stretches of proteins, there are protein domains that are recognized by enzymes. Um, so um, post-translational modifications are being added uh, post-translationally. Okay, great. I'll just um, uh, add, Tom, yes. you know, Namrata mentioned that, that these modifications can inter, uh, interact with each other and sort of there's a certain amount of crosstalk there. And I think she would agree that uh, our ability to understand this or explore it is really just beginning to develop. Uh, for instance, one of the most important events in cancer development is the cancer cells use different fuels or they use fuels differently than, than other types of cells in the body. And we've known about that for a long time. But just now, as we're beginning to be able to look at phosphorylation, ubiquitylation, acetylation of proteins in these cancer cells, we can begin to see patterns that suggest that that specific event, this change in how cancer cells use fuel, is dependent on all of these different modifications of the proteins working in concert. And it's going to take a long time for us, I think, to begin to really tease apart those really complicated circuits and communications. Okay. Uh, one question that, that I actually had, and this is honestly something I've never quite understood. So we have about 20,000-ish genes, depending on how you count. Is the number of genes in the genome and the number of prote proteins in the proteome, is it one-to-one? -one, or can one gene end up producing more than one protein, depending on certain, certain factors? Um. So, so the answer is no, they're not one-to-one. -one. As you saw in one of my earlier slides, the proteome is far more complex. Um, and the reason for that is that you have alternative splicing and you have post-translational modification. So you can think of that as different protein forms, mm -hmm. right? So different forms of a protein don't do the same thing. So there are mechanisms in between um, uh, DNA and making proteins, or even after making proteins, so these modifications that decorate proteins that make many more molecules than just the naked protein. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Mike, here's a question that just came in um, regarding the source material for clinical proteomics. I mean, you touched on blood, you touched on plasma, you touched on tumor samples. Generally speaking, what are the most common uh, sources or tissue sources or biological sources that one might try to run a proteomic study on or run proteomic analyses on? It depends a little bit on what the purpose is of the experiment. Mm -hmm. So I think for one large class of uh, proteomics experiments, those that are designed to develop markers that might help people decide how to treat a particular patient or whether a particular patient was at higher or lower risk of progressing, Working with blood is of great value. And the reason is that it is the standard clinical sample that we can collect. Now I illustrated, I hope to some degree, the complexities of trying to work in blood, but that really is one of the major uh, tissues that we focus on, especially for these direct clinical applications. But for other things, what we really want is to study the disease tissue itself, if it's a question of exploring a, um, uh, of health versus disease. So for instance, we might wanna look at 
a kidney that was beginning to fail from some kind of kidney disease. And there, ideally, we would actually look at a small sample of the kidney tissue and compare it to a healthier portion of tissue. Or I mentioned the case of cancer. There, we're looking at, for instance, a little bit of healthy lung that is cut out at the same time as the tumor is removed from a patient during a resection, and we do that kind of a comparison. There are virtually no limits to the kinds of tissues that we can explore. We do a lot of work in cell lines. We work in what are called patient-derived xenograft models, for instance, where a, a human tumor is grown inside of a mouse whose immune system has been dampened to allow that to happen. That provides us the opportunity to do, for instance, experiments where we treat the tumor uh, with particular drugs that we might not be ready to use yet in the human case. We look at cerebral spinal fluid. We look um, at cell lines uh, frequently because cell lines to an even greater degree allow us to manipulate the system and determine what the effects are of what Namrata was describing as perturbations, maybe treating with a particular set of drugs or having other kinds of variations, including varying the underlying genetic structure of those cells. So there really are no particular limits, but cell lines, tissues, and blood really form the main part of, uh, of our workflow. Great, thank you, Mike. Um, one other question about biomarkers that just came in. You've mentioned those several times over the course of your talk. Uh, one of our audience members was asking about the, the success rate for biomarker discoveries. Uh, it seems to take a lot of steps in order to nail down whether or not a biomarker is actually associated with a disease and then develop a test based on that that's gonna be clinically useful. Um, how many or how hard is it to, uh, to find a biomarker that has clinical utility? It's a question that cuts close to my heart here because the, the answer is uh, our success rate hasn't been very good. Um, it's, you know, most of the markers that are clinically used today were clinically used five years ago and 10 years ago. And there've been little tweaks, but they tend to be tweaks using the same biomarkers. So we think there are a number of reasons for that. One is that very often the questions that have been asked haven't been very specific. So someone will say, oh, I'd like to find a marker to detect cancer. And maybe they have a particular type of cancer in mind, but they don't really get extremely specific about what that marker would have to look like and how it would have to perform and what its characteristics would be and where you'd find it and what subpopulation of that population you'd be interested in and what you would do with the results. And if you don't go into a biomarker discovery project with all of that information and with all of those plans, your likelihood of success is relatively low. A second problem is that until relatively recently, we didn't really have a very good strategy from getting from what I've described as biomarker candidates to biomarkers that actually had been sufficiently studied in enough different sample populations. And a huge tool in that has been what Namrata was describing as these targeted assays, where after looking broadly, we can say, these are the ones that look most promising, but they're not biomarkers yet, they're just candidates. And so if we develop assays around those that are very specific and very sensitive, and that we can measure not in tens of samples or maybe a hundred samples where we did discovery, but in thousands or tens of thousands of samples, that may allow us to get downstream. But there are even complexities beyond that, frankly, Tom. For instance, there has to be some kind of a model for how the biomarker would be used. There'd have to be some kind of a structure for somebody to pay for the biomarker in the end. It would have to be clinically impactful and it'd have to be something that actually altered how care was provided or changed outcomes. And so the answer is it's probably as difficult to generate a biomarker as it is to generate a drug. But there's one exception I'm gonna to make to all of that. And that is in the, context, in the context of developing drugs. So it is now very uncommon for a new cancer drug to be developed without a companion diagnostic biomarker being developed alongside of it to know which patient population would actually benefit from that drug. And I think that gives us kind of the metric. It's a very targeted population. It's a very specific question. And that kind of gives us the, the metric for how one should move forward with effective biomarker discovery. Great. Uh, Namrata, one of, the, uh, one of the members of the audience had a question about how sensitive uh, mass spectrometry is. What's the lowest level at which you can quantify whether or not a protein 
is present in a given sample? And I imagine there's probably a lot that goes into that question or trying to figure that out. Yeah, I mean, there is a lot that goes into that question. It depends on the technique you're using, of course. Um, but, you know, we are in, well into the low nanogram range, probably high picogram range. Um, Mike, I'll let you um, maybe chime in for some of the targeted work. Um, yeah, I, I mean, that's certainly true. I think a big part of it is uh, how narrowly you're defining the sensitivity. So when we're just looking at one protein, and Namrata can speak to this better than I can, but, but atomolar concentrations, teeny, 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 teeny mm -hmm. concentrations can be detected and measured by mass spectrometry. The problem is we're never doing that in the kinds of work that we're talking about. We're never doing that in discovery and so forth. We're always dealing with situations where what we're looking at, even if we try to get it enriched or simplified, is much, much more complex. And there were sort of, you know, all of these measurements interfere with all the other measurements. And so the sensitivity with which we can operate is greatly reduced. All right. I wanted to throw one last question out and Michael, I'll, I'll toss this over to you. You know, we hear talk of a future where everyone will one day be able to go into their doctor's office and have their genome sequenced if they choose to understand their risk of disease. Is there a future that you see where if I'm sick and I go to my doctor's office, um, he might want to measure the state of my proteome as part of my diagnosis. I absolutely believe in that future. And I, th I think, in fact, uh, I don't, I'm not going to predict how many years down the road, Tom, but down the road, uh, you will have your sequence done probably even before you're born, but certainly when you're very, very young. There will be a study of, uh, that will be put in the context of the other people in your family and so forth, whose genetic profiles will be understood. That will be known to confer certain types of risk. You'll say, oh, you're at, you're at somewhat elevated risk to develop kidney disease down the road. And in that sort of more focused way, there will be panels of markers that are in the much more dynamic proteome domain that will be monitored to look for early evidence of disease. Because one thing we know in medicine is that early intervention is always more effective than trying to fix problems that have fully developed. So I think in my view, there's absolutely no question that genomics and proteomics are gonna work hand in hand in the future of personalized medicine. And I'm looking forward to that. And thank you, Mike. Thank you, Namrata. And thank you to everybody who's joined us tonight uh, for this virtual talk. Um, we hope you've enjoyed the evening. We hope you've enjoyed the discussion. And if you like what you heard, please consider watching uh, the other Science for All Seasons talks. They're all available at broadinstitute.org slash SFAS. A recording of tonight's talk will be posted to our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash user slash Broad Institute. To find out about other live streamed events and other new videos from the Broad Institute, consider subscribing. And please tell your friends and family to subscribe too. Thank you again for joining us this evening and have a great night.